OG Rose, and today we're going to be talking about the value isn't the utility, how virtues are matters of values, and how value and utility can overlap, but are not identical categories. This was inspired by an Other Life discussion hosted by Justin Murphy, which I very much enjoyed. It was sent on Aristotle's Nimikian Ethics, and I was very impressed with everyone. Everyone brought much to the discussion and made the text come alive. And we ended up discussing virtue ethics, compare that with utilitarianism, the calculation that goes into so much ethical system today, like you have um, effective altruism, which certainly is not all bad, but it's just there's a lot of the most of the people's ethics today, ethical systems, are very calculational. They, they're very utilitarian. And this paper will ultimately be comparing virtue ex ethics with utilitarianism. I'm not going to be speaking, uh, in moving between, say, effective altruism, pragmatism, utilitarianism, long-termism. These are all different moral philosophies, but I think all of these are very similar in that their main metric is outcome, giving the, um, the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. And that's, that's the thrust. And, by, and it, we can determine the effectiveness in terms of ethics of a given program, to what degree it ex expands the, the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people. Now the paper is going to make a point that I think we've gotten in trouble by talking about virtue ethics versus value ethics. And the reason is because the word virtue is very, um, it's very old fashioned. It sounds like it could risk essentialism, which, which Foucault talks about. And also as theology and religion has been in decline, so the notion of virtue has been in decline. And furthermore, we could even get into sociology as discussed in Belonging Again on the impossibility of character in the current socio sociological structure with Mr. Hunter, Dr. Hunter, Death of Character's book, his book, The Death of Character, and how that also leads to a collapse of virtue. Now, um, that, that I'm not necessarily saying that Dr. Hunter is correct, but I am saying that it's easier to dismiss virtue ethics when it's called virtue ethics uh, and, and therefore fall into autonomous utilitarianism, thinking that utility is the only metric that matters. Um, whereas if we talk about value ethics, we may be able to, in the language, better redeem virtue ethics. And I think it is very important to realize that in Aristotle, virtue and values are very strongly co connected. Um, in fact, virtue is relative to values. And so you can't have virtue unless you have values. And you see today, you see, there is an argument to be made that in Aristotle's ethics, the ends of society and the polis and humans is assumed. It, it doesn't have to be argued. Whereas today, we may have a situation where we can't assume the ends of society. And this is pluralism, right? People have different first principles and stuff like that. Um, so we're going to have to talk about the ends and how we decide the ends. Ultimately, I think the paper will have to point to Nietzsche, the creation of values as children he talks about in Zarathustra. It will have to point to Hume, David Hume, dialectical ethics and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's basically impossible to have an ethic without some sort of value system, without some sort of judgment of values, which is ultimately what Aristotle is saying. Um, you cannot, in ut utilitarianism, determine what constitutes good if your only metric is utility. How can you tell that, say, the spread of health is good if you define health as, say, eating a lot of food or being or having more time? Perhaps having more time just means you have more time to work and you're taking advantage of the corporate system. And perhaps having food means you just eat a lot of preservatives that make you sick. You would have to get into the details. And you would likewise then have to make a value judgment on what kind of foods are good for people to eat and what kind of foods are bad for people to, to eat. Likewise, when you start talking about utility, you will have to make judgments on what is useful and what is not useful, what is productive, what is not productive. And, and productivity itself cannot give you that judgment. It has to come from outside productivity. Now, the point is that a lot, I don't deny that a lot of utilitarianism actually does have value judgments within it that are not purely utilitarian. And I think a lot of modern utilitarians would simply say, oh, well, of course, we're, we're not against making you know, value statements. 
Well, the issue is then at that point you have fallen into Aristotle and we can't continue to do this thing where we say, oh, it's all utilitarianism and we have no place for virtue ethics. Again, we, in this paper will talk about virtue ethics as value ethics. And basically it's impossible to have utilitarianism without evaluation, which would mean value ethics. And you see, here's the thing. Once you understand that ethical action is impossible without values, well, then you have to ask why these values and not the others, which would make you ask, what is it that we are valuing? And if we ask, what is it that we are valuing it, valuing, we're now in the realm of ontology. We then would also have to ask how we know something is valuable or not, or why it has X value versus Y value. And now we're in epistemology. Um, and then we're also going to end up in metaphysics because we're going to have to determine what is value. Like what exactly is value? And we can't say it's just simply the result because we, the valuation of the result is independent of the phenomenon of the result. There's a paper in Reconstructing A called A Critique of Pure Observation. And it says how science cannot tell you what it means. Like science cannot tell you what facts scientific, if scientific observation arises to X, Y, or Z facts, Science cannot tell you what order those facts should come in, what those facts mean, um, and how you should prioritize them. All of that must come outside of facts. In the same way, Cardinal Newman, I love this part where he always, you know, he says words don't tell you what they mean, meaning that we bring to words definitions and understandings. Likewise, we bring to the discoveries of science the worldviews in which those discoveries should fit. Well, so it goes with results, productivity, products, and so on. We value them. We decide external from them the values of them. If we decide, for example, suffering is bad, suffering doesn't tell us it's bad. And in fact, there are lots of examples where suffering is good. Suffering brings out people. Suffering in the gym is good. But you say, well, that's a different kind of suffering. Oh, why? How do you know according to what standard? Well, now we are in the metaphysics. Now we are in ontology. You cannot make utility. The paper will talk about autonomous utilitarianism. And basically that's impossible. You cannot have utilitarianism all the way down. There must be value judgments at some point. And once there are value judgments, you are now dealing with what Aristotle described. So you can't escape Aristotle. Uh, you can't escape that line of thinking. I'm not saying you have to follow the conclusions of Aristotle in detail, but you cannot do ethics without the same considerations of Aristotle, which would inevitably lead you into teleology, what a thing is for, what a thing is. Like if you say X is ethical for humans, well, that's relative to what's ethical for humans. Um, and ultimately, Aristotle is going to really emphasize particularity. For one human, um, it might be ethical to bring him screws and metal. Why? Well, because he's missing a leg and he has a, he has a leg that's made of metal. And so he needs screws. Generally, you can't say that all humans need screws, but this particular human does. And a lot of Aristotle is going to be stressing the discernment and the evaluation live in the act, in the particular encounter of which would help you determine fitting action. And you cannot simply have a general premise such as it's good for humans to have screws <laughs> and, and or it's good for humans to have health and from that have effective policy. Because what is health? What constitutes health? You would say, oh, health, um, it's good to, to have strong lungs, for example. Well, theoretically, there could be an individual that having lungs as strong as Dave is not a priority because they need to spend more time writing, which means you're not going to have lungs as strong as the person who runs all the time. So you have questions of proportion. How do you determine the right proportion for lung size or health or what kind of health? You know, I've always been fascinated that it seems like a lot of people who have intellectual projects live to be very old. Bertrand Russell, Thomas Sowell's still alive. I mean, there are so many intellectuals that live to be very old. Well, does that mean physical health? We should prescribe reading philosophy? Maybe. That might might be better for health than um, exercise, than running and marathon running. In fact, there are some people that argue running isn't that good for you. I don't know about any of that, but do you see why it's not self-evident? What constitutes good health, bad health, so on and so forth? We would have to go into the particular details. And Aristotle is a process of going into the particular details. Again, I think most utilitarians do in fact make value judgments, but by acting as if they don't or by not honoring Aristotle or by acting as if you can do away with virtue ethics, ergo value ethics, it is, it's not clear 
that they're smuggling in a valuation. And thus people don't think that they need to worry about valuation. They just need to worry about the practical outcome or the result and if it does the most good for the most people. Um, when none of that is self-evident and none of it is clear. Um, furthermore, you could have situations where people have terrible character and they're actually very mean, but since they say in poverty somewhere, they're considered a good person. And then of course the question is, what does it mean to end poverty? We'd have to examine that. Now, the paper, the phrase, the value isn't the utility, is alluding to the phrase, the true isn't the rational, which is all throughout O.J. Rose. And the paper, the true isn't the rational, makes the point that the moment you think about something true, it's translated into rationality, which makes it seem as if only rationality was involved, that there was no non-rational variable. But in fact, this is a very quick sleight of hand that occurs due to the act of translation and understanding truth. So that's why it becomes very easy to believe the true is the rational, because the moment you think about the true, it is translated into the rational. Well, likewise, the moment you think about a value, a value is experienced as good and therefore you should act according to it. So the moment you judge a value, you enter into the realm of action and an outcome according to that action. Whenever you act, there will be an outcome of that action, right? Well, that means the valuation is instantly concealed by a consideration of action and utility, which is why it is easy to believe that the value is the utility. Because the moment you consider the value, it is automatically consumed by utilitarian considerations and considerations of action. Because if you believe something is valuable, then of course you must act accordingly, right? You should act according to that value. So this very quick concealment that occurs um, is one of the reasons why it is so difficult for us to understand that the value isn't the utility. Furthermore, indeed, value leads to action. But you see someone like Blondell, you know, in his book, Action, was very concerned about um, utilitarianism. He thought he was a pragmatist or a utilitarian, but then he found out what those terms meant to people and he wanted to make a distinction between practice or pragmatism and action. And basically for him, action entails valuation. It's acting according to values and participating in those values, right? So what we're describing here, basically what we're saying is all utilitarianism, if it's not autonomous utilitarianism, actually is closer to action, according to Blondell. And we, we would, but since we don't know that, or we don't know these distinctions, or we don't know that an evaluation has been smuggled into our thinking, we think that we're, we basically come to conclude that moral considerations are always leading to actions, which action is the same as utility because it action leads to result. Therefore, we're all utilitarians. So that's what ends up happening. And then from that place, you, you go, oh, utilitarianism is all we need. And then that's that. And then we don't own metaphysical, ontological, epistemological thinking. We don't think we need those things. So we don't study philosophy. We certainly don't study like Aristotle's, the metaphysics or something like that. And we basically all end up like neo-pragmatists. Uh, which then has kind of an ethic of utilitarianism, and then that just takes different forms, like long-termism, uh, effective altruism, and so on and so forth. Now, a question arises. Why is it so easy to believe utilitarianism is all we need? Because for most of human history, it practically was all we needed. Um, when you experience poverty, or you see people in pain, or you see people sick, the very facticity of the experience kind of suggests to you what needs to be done. You really don't need to make a meta metaphysical evaluation um, so much. Now, granted you do, but it seems very self-evident. The person is suffering. They are, they are bleeding, for example. All right, well then the ethical thing to do is to get a Band-Aid with, um, with ammonia. Okay, so you do it. The facticity of the situation gives it to you. And the, one of the main claims the paper wants to make is that utilitarianism is a sufficient moral theory for most third world nations. And in fact, for first world nations interacting with third world nations, utilitarianism will work. And you'll notice that effective altruism and all of that tends to be very focused on poverty alleviation and stuff of that nature. And indeed, utilitarianism is quote unquote sufficient and fitting or practically fitting enough for considerations of um, situations that are hard or terrible or involve suffering given to us by our facticity. It's more self-evident what we need to do. And so for most of history, all we basically needed as a moral theory was utilitarianism. 
Um, and indeed, we need utilitarianism in our mental model tool belt. Like, it, we're not, no one is arguing in this paper that we get rid of utilitarianism. What we are arguing against is autonomous utilitarianism or the impression that utilitarianism can occur without evaluation. That's what we're arguing against. And a claim of the paper is that value ethics can entail utilitarianism, but utilitarianism doesn't so readily um, entail value ethics consciously. Um, it unconsciously does without realizing it, or else it eats itself, basically. Um, so, but, but, but the key here is that utilitarianism, when you're dealing with poverty or things given by your facticity, is good enough of a moral theory. But the problem is the following. As you move into a first world nation, as prosperity and the standard of living goes up, utilitarianism proves very insufficient. It does not tell you, say, how you should treat your wife. If she's not, say, if she's hungry, well, then it tells you to get her food. But let's say she's not hungry. What do you do? What is right action in that circumstance? Well, now you're an Aristotle. You have to ask questions of what is fitting. What should you do? The great, you know, the great Dr. Philippe Nicholas, he has this line in his poetry collection, uh, which I highly suggest, Shadia, S-A-E-D-A-H, you can find it, has this line where he says, up until now, we have survived so as to live well. But now may be the time that we must live well if we want to survive. I think that captures it very, very well. Utilitarianism helped us survive to get to the place where we can live well now. But it is overfitting, to use that term from computer science, which I believe I'm using correct, but forgive me if I'm not. To use it now is overfitting. And it's very consequential because it's just not sufficient to help us determine how we should live, how we should live well. It can help us figure out how to survive and it can fi help us figure out how to treat people whose survival is in jeopardy or who are facing situations that are more self-evidently bad due to the facticity, but it cannot help us what to do on a normal weekday in say the United States of America after we get home from work. This is a different ball game and a more sophisticated ethics is needed. And in fact, I think we have to keep in mind that Aristotle is probably teaching mostly to upper class people in his time. His ethics, the ethics he put forth, is probably more toward people who are not having to do manual labor as much. They probably have more leisure time. I don't know this for sure, but I, I would assume this is the case. And so their ethical considerations are going to be more of what to do, say, with the problem of leisure, as Bertrand Russell talks about, a very, very serious problem, the problem of leisure today. Lacan and Freud, you know, Freud was adamant that psychoanalysis would become more necessary in first world nations. It really wasn't necessary in third world nations. Um, in fact, it could be over, you know, it could be over, it would probably be unfitting to try to introduce psychoanalysis to third world nations because they don't have to deal with so many existential mental problems because they can find meaning in life by simply feeding themselves because it's difficult to get food or by providing housing because it's difficult to have housing. And so you can find meaning in belonging and fittedness in accomplishing those tasks. And for most of human history, that's what humans did. They found belonging and meaning in addressing their immediate circumstance that entailed various difficulties. Today, uh, a lot of the manual labor is not so necessary. Our situation, we have washing machines, we have technologies that make um, daily life not so demanding. And so humans have more free time. Well, when they have more free time, they have to have a way to determine what they ought to do with that free time. And you see, here's the thing. If humans do not own the method by which they value what they should do with their time, they're basically, what's going to happen is they're going to be captured by the socioeconomic order. Capitalism will define for you your values. You'll be captured. You'll be enframed. And Mr. Murphy brought that up in Heidegger's enframement. How we all, you know, it's basically, we it's either frame or be enframed. Those are the choices. And then you bring up delusion capture. So we need a method, a way of thinking that will um, help us to deal with the problem of leisure, which would be an ethical system that is more like what we find in Aristotle than in basic utilitarianism. Of which, again, the reason why it's so tempting to use utilitarianism or to become autonomous utilitarians is precisely because it was so effective for so long. In the same way that it's tempting to overfit science because science works so freaking well. We have problems of scientism and the deconstruction and reductionism because they work, not because they don't work. So utilitarianism works. 
but that's the problem because it works it's very difficult to give up your tool it's very get it's very difficult to give it up because it worked but if we don't give it up if we don't transition into value ethics we will be in trouble the paper will allude to some of the stuff that walker percy says in his magnificent essay the delta factor and i suggest his novel lancelot which i think is really good and he asks, why is man apt to feel bad in a good environment, say suburbia, Sword Hills, New Jersey, on an ordinary Wednesday afternoon? Why is the same man apt to feel good in a very bad environment, say an old, old hotel at Kilongo during a hurricane? Now, Percy has a lot to say on this. But it seems to be that if all we have is utilitarianism and we're on a, it's a good, nice, beautiful, sunny afternoon, we don't know what to do. The situation doesn't tell us right action. If there's someone suffering nearby or we're low on food, well, the situation tells us what to do. Go get food, help the person, feed someone. But outside that circumstance, it's not clear what we should do. In fact, to do something, we have to make a choice for ourselves. Well, now we're in existentialism. Now we're responsible. Why do we make X choice versus Y choice? Now we're in, now we're in a pit. How do we know that this is a good choice? And what is fitting for me? in this environment where I can choose to do anything or more things. Well, that's all very difficult and anxiety producing, so we'll probably just offsoar the decision to capitalism and go entertain ourselves with a movie and follow some sort of extrinsic motivations. But what Aristotle is providing us with is a schema by which we could do something more intrinsic, something where we discover on our own, our own values and live according to those values. And if we take the Nietzschean route, we treat those values like a law that we hang around our neck and directs us. And indeed, I think Nietzsche's children, those who create their own values. And what Aristotle is putting forth is very, very similar. And it will also get tied into um, David Hume, who warns about moral theories, just like utilitarianism, that can tempt us to off, off um, outsource moral decision-making to those theories at the expense of the common life and suchness and immediacy in which we are embedded, into which we can make a real difference if only we were not blinded by theory. So, first world nations will find that utilitarianism is inadequate. And what I think actually ends up happening is it just gets captured by this personal optimization culture where everything is about personal optimization. And then that's Silicon Valley and it, 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 you know, you're working all the time. And, and look, if people want to live that way, that's fine. But I unfortunately believe that most people's values that lead them that way are just absorbed and captured by the system. They're not necessarily a product of their own values. Maybe they are. You can't judge. I can't say that a given person isn't such. But I think a problem is this personal optimization culture seems to suggest where utilitarianism ends up if we don't have a value ethic. And what ends up, of course, happening is op you're optimal to the degree you're productive in capitalism. So the definition of optimizing yourself or using your skills or using your gifts or not wasting your time or using your time well is all relative to capitalist metrics. Are these the met metrics that we want to live by? Well, if we say yes, then we've made evaluation. If we say no, well, why? Why not? According to what valuation? Again, you have fallen into value ethics, but this leads into existential tension and anxiety. And in order to avoid that, we could be tempted to just be captured or to tell ourselves that all we need to do is pay attention to the result. And I find it very interesting in book five of The Gay Science that Nietzsche is not a big fan of utilitarianism at all because he thinks it basically is for us to outsource thinking and responsibility to the result where we don't have to think because X will do the greatest good. And so we just do that. It's, and so we let our action be bestowed by the utilitarian consideration. You know, it's like Mr. Ebert was mentioning at the net um, 34 the other day, how we could use chat GPT, feed it a moral question and it will give us the result. And then we're not responsible because we're just doing what AI said, you know, which is, you know, it's the most rational source. So then we become like Eichmann in Jerusalem, who was just following the rules. He was told to do the trains in the, um, the Holocaust. So that's all he was doing. And that sort of thoughtlessness that is described throughout belonging again seems um, to become what is very tempting then when we can just have utilitarianism and the result tell us what's good and wrong and what we should and should not do. If we can tell our AI to do uh, what we should and should not do and if a moral theory would so guide us. Value ethics would have us make the valuation. This is our own work. This is not from something external. We are responsible. And 
Only we, though, can be so responsible because only we can encounter people in their particularity to make discernments and judgment according to which we should act and find fitting. It's very problematic, and I've spoken with this with Dr. Simkin, and it also came up in the other life conversation. You know, we tend to decide that ethics is a matter of like thought experiments, like the trolley problem. Um, this is horrendous, frankly, because the trolley problem is a situation, and it suggests that ethical, like being ethical, is a matter of making the right decision in situations, where in Aristotle, the ethical life is the work of a lifetime. It is the cultivation of a garden over a lifetime of virtue and character and beauty. The trolley problem suggests that you're ethical if you can do a, calcul a weird calculation in a weird situation by which you kill some people and not others, but hey, it's for the greater good. Sure, an ethical calculation as such would prove necessary if one found themselves in a trolley problem or the, the, that magnificent movie, The Eye in the Sky, which is basically a trolley problem. So certainly there is places for such episodes. And Mr. Dr. Semkin and I spoke about the need to replace the trolley problem with the missile ballistic defense system problem, which is a multivariant problem, not a linear problem like the trolley problem, which is part of the issue. Um, but if we come to believe that the trolley problem is all there is to ethics, and I basically think that this is how college teaches ethics, these just thought experiments or weird situations, and which all imply that ethics is silly at the end of the day, basically, because you can always come up with some thought experiment to show that the ethical code is wrong. Um, well, of course you can, because it's autonomous. It's unbound to a particularity. It's autonomous rationality in disguise. You know, if all you can do is just come up with an ethical, ethical idea or a hypothetical situation, you will always be able to find reason to doubt something. And if doubt is the criteria to deconstruct, then we end up with nothing. And that's unfortunately, I think, what ends up happening in a lot of ethical classrooms. Anyway, um, in a first world nation, um, utilitarianism will prove inadequate to help us decide how we should live and how we should act. And you see, I find very interesting in so many of these first world nations that there's, a lot, there's so much talk about how it was a big mistake for humans to become farmers, to stop hunting and gathering. There's a lot of talk in the environmentalism where basically it would be better if humans didn't grow, they didn't have babies, they didn't have produce because it's going to kill us all. And then you also have antinatalism, which is a belief that birth is immoral. I am not saying that every utilitarian um, believes these things or leads, but there is something about utilitarianism that seems to give rise to philosophies or ways of thinking or ethical codes that suggest it would be better if humans didn't act. It would be better if they weren't acting. And for me, it would seem as if what happens is utilitarianism leads us through being a third world nation, creates prosperity, to a place where then we have to make decisions for ourselves. But you see, the only ethical code we have is still utilitarianism, which can't tell us what to do in those situations. And so we can't act. And so we then conclude it would be best if we couldn't act or we didn't act. And that action becomes bad. And so then there's a lot of, it would just be better if humans didn't exist. If we can't establish that human life has value in of itself, and if we can't find value or make values for ourselves, then, then, then how can we act? And why act if there is no moral action? Seems selfish. If no action can create value, if no action can create virtue, why? Doesn't seem to be an answer. And, and it becomes difficult to say why things like suicide or antinatalism, these different things, it becomes difficult to say why they're wrong. Because you, to say they're wrong, you have to establish a value and defend it and stand by it. The other sentiment is this notion that AI will replace us all, that it's inevitable that AI replace the human race. You know, it, it's very, this is an example of why it's so dangerous to think that the brain is just a computer. Because if the brain is just a computer, why not just replace it with, you know, AI that's a better computer? It seems very difficult to stop this. That's why I think we need to think of the brain as a garden. We need to think of it as possible to grow things that are not reducible to it. Dr. Lance has done very good work on the problem of the mind and the brain and the irreducibility of one to the other. There is something special about the human mind. It has a function 
a special function of the human being that Aristotle will discuss in the need to defend. If we don't believe that, then why should humans stay around? Why should they act? All action seems selfish, and therefore the most moral action is non-action, the cessation of action, which would lead into antinatalism, things like that. The paper will also tell a story, uh, a quick two-paragraph thought experiment about an individual that believes it would be best to help people find the courage to commit suicide, um, because otherwise the population of the planet will destroy the environment and to create the most good for the most people would be to remove human beings because humans are destroying the biosphere and he thinks it's kind of bigoted to only apply utilitarianism to human life not sentient life um also too he makes the point that yeah someone who kills themselves would cause their parents great suffering but you know if the parents did something immoral according to antinatalism you know they're just getting their they, you know they deserve it right um, the, the reason the thought experiment is presented in this work, although generally I think thought experiments are, happen too much in ethical philosophy, the reason it's in here is one, because you literally do unfortunately now have blogs today where people are encouraging one another to commit suicide, and there's a video that's very shocking uh, called Encouraging the Young to Die, the most toxic side I've ever seen. It's truly awful. Um, why has this arisen now, today? Why is this around? Like, why is it that in the collective consciousness you have this phenomenon exist? Now, I am not saying that something like suicide or things like this is only occurring today in the world, today. It has, of course, always been with us, um, and it is, it is a very hard reality. But there is something about utilitarianism that seems very weak to stop all this. Um, and, of course, you could say, you know, someone could argue, well, we shouldn't stop all this, right? Well, if, if you say that, uh, why? Where, you know, how do you make that valuation? Um, according to what standard? Well, you could say because of the outcome. It creates the most good for the for sentiments on planet Earth, for the biosphere. All right. Very hard to, to stand against that argument unless you make a value statement where you say no human life is special. There is special about something special about human beings, and they have value. But even if you said that, if human beings don't have the ability to create values for themselves, like Nietzsche and children, it will be hard to practically believe that human life has value, even if you believe that in the back of your mind somehow. You will not have a regular carrying out of habits and actions that will reinforce the notion that humans are capable of creating values, which seems very wild. You know, we've been able to invent things, to create things, to bring about the conditions of beauty, to bring about conditions that the biosphere would have never brought about on its own. Now you could say, well, it's been destructive and it's done harm, but it's also been miraculous. I would consider the music of Beethoven miraculous. I would consider some of the, ex the expressions of happiness and joy that we see on the planet miraculous. The fact that humans aren't, that they're, it's possible for animals not to just live in the mud, to not just be red in tooth and claw, that it's possible for them to give rise to civilization and to society. Is there not something valuable in this? Is there not something good, true and beautiful? If we say yes, then we've made a value judgment and we've entered into the realm of Aristotle. And maybe the problem is today that we don't enter into the realm of Aristotle enough. And as a result, we have proven weak to stand against or to stop the spreading mental health crisis, the meaning crisis. I would even talk about a courage crisis inspired by Mr. Eber. And certainly we have a crisis of motivation and the inability of people to intrinsically motivate themselves by the creation of their own values. But why should they create their own values? How can they create their own values if their only standard of value is an outcome and a result of which doesn't exist until they act and will not be given to them by their facticity? And so people do not act. And they come to believe that it would be better not to act. Because why act if moral action is not possible? If it is not possible to act in a manner that creates value or virtue, then why? And there's no answer unless there is a meaning crisis. Aristotle is a thinker whom we need to consider and incorporate into our thinking. There are other thinkers that also are very valuable. Hume, Hegel. If we don't consciously own the necessity of some form of virtue ethics and value ethics, then we in a first world nations, we will find prosperity to be a curse. It will be the achievement of a state in which we have no idea 
how we should decide, what standard according to which we should decide how we should live. We have no way to decide how we should live. We've been trained to, to have that question answered by our environment and the environment no longer answers it. And so we either are captured, we become thoughtless for the values of the zeitgeist of capitalism and thus just go along with that. Or we become hopeless and nihilistic and go along with that. But maybe there's another alternative. Maybe there's the alternative of becoming Nietzschean children, to be childlike again, not just childish. What if it was possible for us to create our own values and to live according to those values? Because life is worth living, because life is valuable. Life is not something for which the only possibility of right action is to hope for its cessation or its non-existence. And for me, a key way that we can come to engage in practices by which we believe and feel that life is good is practices and focuses that cultivate beauty, that condition us to receive beauty and to be beautiful. And indeed, I would say in Aristotle, the goal of virtue is beauty. It is an end in its own right, but that end is not utilitarian, utilitarian as we've now come to think of the word end. The end is a beautific vision. The meaning of life is to be a beautific vision. The height of virtue is to be a beautific vision. This requires courage, as Mr. Ebert has said. This is, requires character. And so we see character in Aristotle. We cannot reach the place where we might be a beautific vision and thus inspire others and inspire ourselves without character and without the work of conditioning of which requires us to face difficulty and to rise to their occasion. And we will not rise to their occasion if we so see no reason to do so and we don't value overcoming the difficulty. But if we were to create values for ourselves and live according to them, then we might see why the fate of beauty is the fate of us. Because if we can make life beautiful, then we will be attracted to its goodness, and that goodness will be true. It will not be an illusion where the antinatalists are the ones facing the truth while the rest of us are not. No, we will have created a world where life is good. For more by O.G. Rose, please visit ogrose.com, Twitter, Instagram, Anchor, and thank you so much for your time.